the shooting range. In this episode, Pages of History, the first wheeled IFV, Map Guide, the Ash River, and Metal Beasts, the modernized Light Swede. In this episode's Metal Beasts, we're moving aside from South African armor, top supersonic jets and MBTs to take a look at something that might seem unremarkable at first. Please welcome the Swedish light tank with a not-so-light name, Infanterikannenwagen 91105. In the mid-1960s, the Swedish army launched a program to create a new light machine that would combine both high-speed and powerful weaponry. The result was the EQV-91 tank, later rearmed for export markets. Its main firepower is the two-plane stabilized 105mm gun with elevation angles between minus 8 and plus 15 degrees. Auxiliary weapons include a couple of 8mm machine guns. The tank also has smoke launchers, while the commander and the gunner can each use the night vision device. The crew layout is classic, with the engine compartment in the rear. The armor on the IGV-91 is thin, even for a light tank. Imagine it's made of drywall with some aluminum foil on top to make it prettier. We're talking just how thin that is. The frontal armor won't save you even from a large caliber machine gun at a short distance, let alone the roof, the sides or the rear. Basically, the tank is so fragile, anything is a threat to it. The only way to stay longer on the battlefield is to play with extreme caution, avoiding enemy fire at all costs. On the plus side, this tank's small mass enables it to swim and provides a high level of mobility. Its maximum speed on an even road is 65 kilometers per hour. You can even fire your gun at full speed, thanks to the two-plane stabilizer. Anyway, if that were everything the tank had, we wouldn't see it have a BR of 8.3, would we? The IGVA's main advantage is its powerful gun and modern APFSDS rounds. There is basically no enemy it's unable to successfully hit in the front. All in all, this is a classic glass cannon. Thanks to comfortable elevation angles and straightforward ballistics, this machine is perfect for a long-distance style of gameplay. Just remember to change your position often enough, preferably after every couple of shots. If you anticipate a hot situation, retreat! 11 kph in reverse is far from a record, but just enough to make it on time. And as a last resort, your three smoke shots are likely to last the whole battle. When you're about to hear a story about the development of armored vehicles, you usually expect some version of a famous European, American or Asian vehicle. However, the military industries of the world had their own paths full of twists and turns, which sometimes resulted in unique and highly peculiar models. And the South African vehicles are great examples of that. This country used to be called the Union of South Africa when it was part of the British Commonwealth. The Union was expected to support the British Army in Africa and the Middle East in case of war, so their armor was expectedly British-made. However, in 1961, the country left the Commonwealth, declared independence, and became known as the Republic of South Africa. It did little to improve the relationship with Great Britain, of course, so they had to look for other suppliers. West Germany saw this chance and took it. They shared some technologies with South Africa and helped to organize their own production. The main task for the South African military was to protect the nation's lengthy borders. This required some simple, affordable and reliable vehicles with a long range. 
Since most of the border ran across arid semi-desert areas, tracked tanks and APCs were unsuitable due to the quick wear of their chassis, while existing wheeled vehicles didn't comply with the requirements. So, by the late 1960s and early 70s, the South African Defence Force had developed a new doctrine and commissioned the first wheeled IFV in the world. The intention was for it to be capable of carrying personnel over large distances, sustaining machine gun fire, and attacking enemy armour when possible. The development of this new machine was in the hands of Springfield Bussing Company, which didn't take long to create the Ratel or Badger in Afrikaans. It's based on the modified six-wheel chassis of a German truck with a multi-fuel diesel engine. It promised good off-road capabilities and a range of up to 1,000 kilometers. The reliable and undemanding Ratel could carry a force of nine troops, operate far from railroads, and even pose as a light-wheel tank on the battlefield. Its combat history started in Angola, where South Africa was fighting local guerrillas. Thanks to its mobility advantage, the new IFVs could carry out attacks from most unexpected directions. However, real combat exposed a significant flaw as well. Its 20mm autocannon wasn't good enough. Mind you, it could attack light armor all right, but fortifications and tanks needed something much heavier. The solution was a new turret with a 90mm gun that could penetrate even the Soviet T-54. Ratels of various modifications are still in service in 11 nations across Africa and the Middle East, reminding us that excellent combat vehicles aren't exclusively coming from Asia, America or Europe. This week, we continue sharing tips and tricks for ground maps. And today's highlight is one of the classic maps with prominent landscape features, the Ash River. Let's start with the West team and their balcony position. Only two advantages are found here, controlling the central part of the map and a line of fire at point C. It's a perfect place for a tank destroyer with thick frontal armor. The second position is found along map line H, close to the spawn point. If your tank can boast a thick turret and good elevation angles, you'll have no trouble controlling point C and approaches to the center of the map. You can also try to capture point C itself, heading off the south respawn point. The best way to go about that is to take the route below the hill. This way, you'll be out of reach for those enemies who occupy the balcony or the southern part of the map. Be careful before getting to the point itself, though. You can either wait for the enemy to become distracted to avoid their fire, or employ your smokes. Once you're in the area, direct your attention to point B first thing. All enemy vehicles will be plainly visible. Once you're done with them, you can finish off the enemies on the plateau. Now, let's see what's going on in the central part of the map. The first useful position is found in the rocks next to the closest bridge. It allows you to help your allies on almost any direction of attack. You can fire at enemies around point C and line H, control approaches to the central hill, or even destroy those enemies who got to the depression area near point A. Position number two is found in the capture area on the central hill. Don't rush here across the bridge at the beginning of the battle, since there's a high chance of getting around in your side. More so, considering there's a safe climb here. Once you've captured this point, stay on the hill and defend yourself against enemies that can attack you from two directions. The last position for the West team is next to point A. Again, don't rush down at the beginning of the battle. Wait near the rock to attack a couple of inattentive opponents. Once the path is safe and sound, it's time for you to finally capture the area. 
How about the East team? Many of their positions mirror the West team, so there's no point in discussing them all over again. First, the balcony next to the respawn point. It offers just as nice a view at the central part of the map, but you'll have to leave cover to fire at the enemy. Simply put, don't risk it unless it's absolutely necessary. Instead, you can take a look at the visible part of the plateau and the approaches to point C, since they offer a better line of fire. Your strategy in the southern part of the map will be familiar. The only difference for the east team is that their players should keep closer to the center of line H to have a better line of fire. Going to point C at the beginning of the round is dangerous for the east team. A better option is to hide behind the rock and prevent the enemy from getting to the capture area. Now the area where the east team has the advantage is the central hill. The north respawn point offers a quick and safe way to point B across the bridge. Once you're in the capture area, brace for enemy tanks since they're coming soon. As soon as the situation eases off, take a look at point C. Since the enemy team might get too engaged in their battles, drive up to the edge of the plateau and expose their sides. The final position for today is found next to point A. Your actions here mirror the enemy teams. Don't rush down. Defend against enemy attacks. Well, folks, that's about it for this map. We wish you safe passages and lucky shots. Meanwhile, it's time for us to answer some of your questions. The first question was sent by a player called Pentatome. What's the binocular icon below the repair icons in the lower left corner of the tank UI? Hello, Pentatome. It's a spotting range indicator. The more tankers you lose in a round, the poorer job your crew does at spotting targets. Vashek2 asks, Why has the Challenger 1 Mark II two types of ammunition, and the base type has better penetration than the second. Which do you have to research? Hi there. True, the stock APF SDS has a high penetration rate at zero degrees, but in battles, it matters much less than hits at 30 to 60 degrees. That's why we recommend you use the L23A1 shots. Another question comes from Common Pork. Why don't planes like to pull negative Gs, and which plane can pull the most negative Gs? Hi. The thing is, planes experience positive Gs much more often. Special suits were even created to make it easier for pilots to sustain the overload. High negative G-force is so rare that engineers don't really need to take them into account when designing wings. As for records in sturdiness, most fighters have the same numbers of the load they can sustain. 10 to 12 positive Gs and 3 to 5 negative Gs. Game Buddy Mass writes, Why not give the ability to nuke in realistic battles? Hi there, Game Buddy Mass. That's what we thought, actually. Why not? With the Ikwa Strike update, the nuclear bomb has become available in realistic battles for 3,000 spawn points. <laughs> Good luck! And the last comment for today was written by Leonardo Baldi. Could you do Pages of History episode about the M13-40? Greetings from Italy. Hi, Leonardo. It's a good idea. Our historians have already dug themselves into the archives. <laughs> Expect a story soon. That's it for today. You've been watching The Shooting Range by Gaijin Entertainment, and the next episode will premiere the following Sunday at 4 p.m. GMT or noon Eastern Time. Subscribe and click the bell if you don't want to miss our next videos. I do. Don't forget to leave a like. <laughs> I do as well. Share your thoughts and comments, and we'll see you next week.